I have a habit of talking quickly and I have a habit of talking for too long. So if I'm doing either of those two things, just yell out at me, okay? Um, thanks, Charles. It was, uh, it's really, I was in, I've been incredibly fortunate to be at SJB. I've been there now this week, 24 years. I never had another job. Um, so everyone keeps asking me for career advice and I'm like, I have no idea. Just go to one place and keep working. <laughs> Um, so I've broken the talk up, it's uh, kind of loosely into three components, a bit about observation and background because I think it's important, I think a lot of work that we do comes from where we came from, so to talk a little bit about that. A bit about observations about what we love in the world and what we don't love in the world, a bit about um, some research we've been doing and then some project work and some of the projects I'll flick through quite quickly because you might have seen them and they're maybe not as interesting, uh, and, but towards the end I think there's some projects where I think I feel a little bit like we're starting to mature into a practice um, that I think is starting to do some nice work. Um, we started in SJB in Sydney with the S and the J and the B and two of us, uh, and we're now about 90 staff in the architecture practice. So, um, so let's just give you a bit of context. This is where I grew up. This is country Victoria, Ararat. Um, it hasn't changed actually, except the cars have changed. Everything's exactly the same. I didn't love it when I grew up there. I mean, I kind of didn't know any better. Uh, I go back there now and it's a pretty fantastic, gorgeous place. Um, I pretty much grew up on this hill. That's our house there, overlooking this town. Uh, my family still live there and I feel very um, privileged to have lived in this environment. It's a very unique, um, small country town. Uh, it has the largest wind farm in the Southern Hemisphere and actually the houses that have a view of the wind farm from the city actually have higher values than the ones that don't because the kind of moving of the wind, farm, wind turbines is quite beautiful to watch from a, that distance. It's quite lovely. Um, but there's a very, very strong community, um, this kind of idea of Anzac Day about what happens on Anzac Day and people coming together. It's really remarkable. My family used to live there, my brother and his kids and wife and my parents still live there. Um, I've always been interested in this idea of uh, shadow and nature and the kind of... Uh, this idea of what lies behind something, this kind of um, history of a place, um, both in nature but also in building and this the kind of way in which activities that happen in a city, the way you pull down a building, reveals old, oldness that happens in cities and that kind of, it starts to talk to you about what used to happen. Um, moments in cities which may be not so beautiful but um, they become outdoor galleries, the way in which everyone loves to kind of, this is in Barcelona, facing the sun and getting a piece of Bit of, bit of sun on this, these fixed chairs and in London the same kind of idea but in a kind of movable chair. The kind of um, artistic uh, kind of expression that landscape architecture can make, the way in which public art really starts to make a place and you can kind of talk to somebody and say well I'll meet you at the, this is just behind the Louvre in, London, in Paris. Um, little things, when I was at University at Melbourne Uni, um, this used to be the awfulest part of um, the river and suddenly they put this blue line underneath the railway line and suddenly it became a place. You kind of knew where it was and you didn't feel as quite as scared of that place anymore. So it was really just very, very small things that changed the way a city works. These really beautiful moments where nature takes over buildings and then when architecture kind of replicates that idea and this is the Jean Nouvel building in Paris. Um, so I really like that kind of parallel of observation and then um, kind of reinvention. The kind of observation of these beautiful historic um, gates in, in Japan and then the kind of Christo's kind of reinterpretation of that in Central Park in, in New York I think is really pretty special. Uh, our own kind of, I now, I'm, I, I, Charles sent me to Sydney for three weeks, 18 years ago. Um, so I never actually chose to move, I just moved and I just one day woke up and thought, hmm, the weather's good in Sydney. <laughs> uh, and my parents didn't live in Melbourne anyway and I thought, oh, why don't we just stay, that's kind of fun. Um, and to be quite honest, there was two of us in the office and I got away with murder, really. <laughs> um, but there's beautiful places like this in Sydney which you take for granted living there, but this kind of cathedral <coughs> of a space that the, that the figs make in um, Hyde Park is pretty remarkable. Um, Santa Catarina Markets in Barcelona, kind of this, this kind of expression of beauty in the, in the old um, markets that exist um, in the centre of the town and this beautiful addition that has been been built on top of it, but actually it was funded by these buildings that sat behind. So the way in which development can actually fund kind of public benefit is kind of, this was a bit of an eye-opener to me. This was um, a few, maybe 15 years ago that I saw this building. Um, the way in which light reflects and shadows and there's this kind of play on in architecture. Um, I also did a Churchill Fellowship in 2007. I was lucky enough to um, spend six, one of, the, one of the agreements I made with the SJ and the B when I became a partner was that 
say, oh, that would be good. I actually didn't know what that meant. Both my parents were public servants, so <laughs> there had never been a discussion about owning a business or running a business. And so when Charles offered it to me, I was like, oh, that sounds good. Does that mean I, have, I can't take holidays? And he was like, no, you can take holidays. I should have known from Charles and Michael I could take holidays. Um, <laughs> But I said, okay, within the first four years of being a partner, I want to have six months off. And they said yes. So eight years later, I took six months off. And um, I was fortunate enough to get a Churchill Fellowship. This was some time I spent in, um, in Bogota in Colombia with um, the mayor at the time. Uh, was an amazing um, man. And they, this, is a, this is kind of a part of the roughest area in Bogota. Um, this is the public road. This is the, bike, the footpath and this is the bike path. So there's this amazing position that they took about where they would invest their public funds in this city because 10% of the people owned cars and 90% of the people couldn't afford them. So they totally revolutionised the city um, from that point of view and it became an amazing, amazing city to be in. Um, moments like this in Manhattan where you see actually the community know exactly where the sun sits on this rooftop, um, which as an architect you often, it takes you weeks and weeks to work that out, but you look down you see the banana lambs there, it's like, okay, that's where the sun lives. Um, the massive change that has happened because of Wi-Fi and internet in our cities. So this kind of moment of, you know, these two women reading, you know, they're kind of almost diametrically opposed, the young re reading the, reading the uh, printed version and the old reading the computer. But this way in which it's really revolutionised the way in which we use public space. Um, this beautiful moment where these two kids are sitting in the, in the um, statue, which is really about why I do what I want to do, the, the way in which community can engage in public space. Um, if, you, if the river's too dirty, you can, put a, you, know, you can put a swimming pool in the river. This is in Vienna. I think Melbourne actually should do this, but nevertheless. Um, you know, a beautiful idea that if you can't actually swim in it, well, maybe we can still swim in it. Um, you know, you wonder why the US has some problems with its cities, and then you see this, and you kind of think, oh, geez, that's pretty poor. So that's the apartments, and that's the, you know, commercial, so this kind of modernist movement of moving two things apart, which became really problematic and really started to, to fracture a lot of their cities. We were lucky in a way that Australia wasn't as wealthy as the US at that period of time, so they just kind of demolished whole tracts of downtown and built roads. Um, we were lucky enough, Melbourne was lucky that it was too poor to take out the tram lines, so you've still got the tram lines. Sydney was a little bit wealthier, we took out the tram lines, now we're putting them back in. But um, the US had this kind of uh, very, very strict idea about what modernism was. Uh, in Washington DC, this was somebody removing a homeless man from living in, um, living in a train station, which was pretty horrific. Um, but it kind of talks about a, a sensibility to a society or a lack of sensibility to society, I think. Again, uh, you know, this is an amazing space, in um, amazing square in Holland. And uh, I took this photo and didn't realise, but there's another little kid climbing a, climbing a structure. Um, I took this, this, this image because... This space is one of the nicest spaces I've ever been to, but none of the buildings are fantastic. All of the buildings are background. The public space is the thing that really makes this space um, sing, and the buildings are all background. 200 metres away, um, this has been built. This is done by one of the world's, in inverted commas, world's best architects. Um, and I, it's interesting to think that you can have this 200 metres away from this, and when you build this, you don't learn from this. And I think there's a kind of... Lesson, the lesson for me was about the idea that stop making buildings that are objects and start making buildings which are gloves. So make the building a glove to hold the space rather than a, than a building kind of as an icon to call out to people. Um, the way in which in Japan you get these amazing cross uses from kind of kindergartens to roof gardens to apartment buildings and that's something that maybe up until recently we in Australia have never been prepared to do and we're starting to be prepared to do proper mixed use projects. Um, the World um, Housing Expo in Melmo in Sweden, which was really sensational. They gave every country in the European Union a piece of land and said, right, build your best apartment building. So it became this kind of competition between um, countries to build innovative, sustainable buildings, um, which I think is really amazing. And you got, you know, towers through to terrace houses. So there was a really... We don't do built research in this country. Um, it's just not something that we're used to doing. But in Europe, they do a lot of built research. I think we're starting to get our heads into a bit more built research. Uh, and then in Holland, this photograph of a terrace house um, where, you know, in Australia we put photos of our kids on our fridge 
in Holland, they put photos of their kids on the window at the front. Mm -hmm. And it's a really different thing, but it kind of, it talks to this kind of, you can't just take an idea from somewhere else and plant it in Australia and think it's going to be fantastic. You need to kind of read the cultural norms about what happens. Um, and this is all about the fact that, you know, this street actually is more than a street. It becomes the playground for the kids and everyone knows where everyone's kids live and so it becomes really easy for them to be there. And so there's a kind of sense of safety actually about putting these on the windows. So anyway, I came back from the Churchill Fellowship and I was like, okay, well, I've seen all of that, but I want to know what that means. What does that mean to us? Like, what kind of lessons do I take and what do I discard? Um, so I went down a rabbit hole of doing a whole lot of research about densities of cities. Um, I think one of the most fantastic things we could ever do is design housing because housing touches a lot of people. One of the most challenging things to do is design multiple housing. Designing, doing a one-off house for a... Um, if anyone's building a one-off house, they're wealthy, really, in this country. Um, if you're building an apartment, really, you're trying to build for the masses of people. So how do you do that in a way which is, um, is admirable, I suppose? So to start to understand that, we started to look at um, what densities were. And you can see, um, so these are land areas. So the, the larger the dot, the larger the land area. So in this, um, New York and Tokyo, in terms of their metropolitan area, have the largest dots. Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane are quite uh, different, but Melbourne has a bigger footprint than Sydney and bigger than Brisbane. Um, if you look at population levels, you can see that Tokyo, the Yokohama Tokyo kind of um, corridor is one of the largest or is the largest in the world. New Delhi is getting pretty close, Shanghai, Seoul, Beijing. So, you know, the majority of the population is living in kind of this centre part of the world. Density levels, um, so these are people per square kilometre. Um, New Delhi is outshining everybody. Uh, that's not necessarily a good thing because a lot of people in New Delhi live in, um, in uh, squats or hovels or um, you know, in, informal settlements. Um, but nevertheless, you can see there's a lot of heavy lifting in terms of world's population going on in the centre of the world and not much happening at the peripheries. And we have a woefully low. If you, I was talking about this to my parents who are, neither of them um, know much about architecture, but... Uh, I was talking to them about what density means and none of them could kind of get their, neither of them could get their head around it. So I was going, well, okay, which cities do we kind of understand to be similar to Sydney or Melbourne? So we started to look at um, Los Angeles. So this is population, this is land area, this is density. So high population, higher land area, low density. You look at London, high population, small land area, much, much bigger density. You then go to Paris and you say, okay, similar population to London. This was about four years ago, five years ago, we took these start data. Um, land area is a bit bigger, density is um, a bit better than London, uh, a bit less than London, I mean. Uh, and then you look at Sydney and you say, well, actually, we have the lowest density. Um, we have the one of the bigger, uh, so our, our land mass is not, uh, sorry, our land mass is bigger than London's, but our population is kind of a squirt in the middle. So, and then my mum was still like, okay, I don't really know what that means. What does that mean to me? So we started to look at it in terms of how many tennis courts do you take to live your life in that city? And that started to give them a frame of reference about saying, okay, well, what does that mean? So you can just see here, um, Melbourne is two and a half tennis courts per person. Um, Sydney's two tennis courts, Brisbane's three and a half tennis courts. So you can see the kind of comparative analysis, but why does it, why is it so different from London, which is just over half a tennis court, to Sydney, which is just, which is two tennis courts? I mean, we came from the same location. There's obviously, obviously different climatic conditions. There's obviously different settlement patterns over 200 years. But, you know, if someone said, well, who are we most similar to? Lots of people would say we're probably most similar to the British. So, you know, what goes on in that? At the same time, these are queen-size bed mattresses. So this is size of house average across the world. UK, smallest house. Australia, the largest. And that's even worse because these are the size of the houses being built out in suburban sprawl. So there's kind of a, an ongoing issue with the fact that we're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this kind of discussion that we're always having about sustainability is um, really critical, actually, because... We're concretising really the entire eastern seaboard of Australia. There is kind of, you used to be able to drive from town to town, now you just kind of drive between towns. There's kind of becoming no landscape between the two. Anyway, that was a whole lot of research. There was a whole lot of other stuff we did around that. We wrote um, an app which was talking about how you could um, look at your density levels and start to make some decisions in your life that would help change density levels and uh, maybe choose houses of difference. It kind of uh, was fun, it didn't really go anywhere, to be honest. Um, 
But I suppose what I took from that was how in our lives and how in our lives as kind of architects can we start to make a difference to the way in which the type of product we're presenting to the community. What are we delivering? What are we building? Um, this was actually the first project I ever actually ever did, really. It was the competition that Charles sent me to Sydney for 18 years ago for three weeks. Um, since in Sydney, our office is actually here in Sydney, so it was kind of a nice walk to the site. Um, it was an old hospital. It had two state heritage listed buildings, this little chapel and this building here. Some of you might know it, but this, in collaboration, this was, a, this was a project we did with Petal Thought Walker Architects. This was my first foray into collaboration, um, which was challenging, would be the right word. Um, it was quite, quite fraught, actually. It was quite adversarial in terms of a relationship, and it was probably... I learned a lot from that process, both what to do and what not to do, I think, in terms of the collaborative process. But uh, it was a project that I learned a lot on. So I was, as Charles said, I think I was 24, and this was our site, and we walked up there every lunchtime, so it was quite fun. Um, we did a lot. We've learned a lot from this project. Uh, it was 216 apartments. There were these heritage buildings. This building is aligned to ensure that the sun hits the corner of this building at midday. This was the old... Um, refractory that the uh, women who had just had babies would sit in to um, recuperate. So the idea was that the building that was built in front of it would always allow sunlight to hit those windows. There's a lot of embedded kind of design ideas into the way in which we should adjust the site. At the time we did this, the kind of common idea was that you would um, put a kind of fence around the site and you'd put a swimming pool and some palm trees and that became the public domain or the private domain. Um, we challenged that by saying actually Surrey Hills is a lot like Fitzroy in, in Melbourne or St Kilda where the public domain is what makes the place, you know, it's where people eat and hang out. So we opened up the ground plane and allowed people to walk around the ground plane. This became public space and um, retail space. Um, we've learned a lot. There's some successes and failures in this after 18 years, so it's quite nice to watch. I actually lived in this... Oh my, my husband bought this apartment without telling me um, <laughs> about six years after the building was completed. Uh, he came, at, came home, we were living out in Maroubra, and he came home and I said, uh, he was looking, we were looking around to move, and I said, I don't need to go and see that, I designed it, I don't need to see it, I know what it's about. And he came home and I said, I said how was it? He said, it was good. And I was like, oh, good. And about an hour later, he said, yeah, actually, it was really good. I said, oh, good. And he said, yeah, we bought it. And I was like, what? <laughs> Anyway, so we lived there. Um, uh, it was quite, it's quite good to live in a building you design because at the time we, we, we designed these pods to have the doors to these, this was retail, to have the, the apartments above, the doors were sitting in these pods. And the idea was we'd hide the doors in the pods so that, you know, it was all hidden, it was all lovely. It's really bloody annoying when you live there and someone comes to visit because they can never find the bloody door. Um, so, you know, you learn a lot by, by kind of um, living in one of your buildings. But it was a great place to live, really energetic, um, Fun, fun, fun kind of project to work on and also to deliver. Um, the second one was a project we did in Glebe Harbour, which we won in competition. So Sydney Harbour comes under the bridge and Glebe Harbour wraps in, and this is the old um, White Bay um, sitting through here. The International F Passenger Terminal is now over here. Um, sits in through here and the fish markets are here. Um, it was this piece of land that uh, was partly owned by council, partly owned by state government, partly owned by the Crown and partly owned by a private client. It was very intense. Um, and it was an old shipping container yard, except that no shipping containers had come off a boat onto the land for 80 years. Every shipping container had come down a street and been parked here and just been stored there. So it was kind of horrendous for the street of, um, of um, Glebe. Um, we were incredibly naive and we did a painting for the competition. <laughs> but we won. Um, <clears throat> but the intent with the painting was that we would take this idea of these small terrace typologies down the hill and you could almost not see where it turned from being the old part of the city to the new bit we were making. Um, to our delight, there was this little building. I had been lucky enough to live at Newman College at Melbourne Uni, um, which is a Walter Billy Griffin building. Um, to our delight, that was a Walter Billy Griffin building, which the council had owned. Um, so this was the site when we originally found it. Um, this was the Walter Billy Griffin building. It had been completely bastardised by councils over the years. So all of these castellations had been cut off, cut open, new windows put in. Like it was horrendous, it was falling apart. The chimney was gone. Like it was, there was maybe one tenth of the building left. Um, the only thing we had to, decide, to help us uh, adaptively and restore this building was this photo 
and this photo. <laughs> there was no other drawing. So there was a lot of kind of investigative work to try and work out what was original, what wasn't original, and what it should have been originally at the, at the start. Um, it used to be the idea that the, the um, carts and the horses would come up around and they would dump their rubbish into here and it would feed through gravity, if you know anything about Griffin's um, history of doing these buildings, feed through gravity into the furnace um, and it would be um, fired and then they'd take the soot out of the bottom and there was sorting, you can just see here there was some sorting yards, sorting sheds, so the, the horses used to come in, they would sort out all the rubbish, they'd put it into piles and then they'd decide which bit was burnt and which bit was thrown into the harbour. At this point, this was the most sustainable way of dealing with rubbish. So up until this point, every bit of rubbish was thrown into the harbour, um, which was probably not that bad then because it was probably all organic matter. But um, up at, the, now at this point, um, it started to become um, burnt, furnished. Um, we did a whole lot of excavation works, looking at what was actually there under the ground. Um, again, this was at Australand. We, uh, we took this through competition, DA and construction, um, the incinerator. We, we re-established the footprint and scale of the original um, chimney because it used to be the, the original, the highest thing on that peninsula when it was first built. So we wanted to give it back its height. Um, but in a contemporary way, contemporary format, we put the castellations back in, we created the original openings and this became a community room within the whole site. Um, this was kind of the nicest, this was one of the really nicest parts of the project. Um, you can, the landscaping happened around, these photos were taken this was taken when it was finished. So this idea of the rhythm coming down the street of the terrace houses to the rhythm of this apartment building uh, and the way in which kind of blank walls and blank walls, we, we wanted to take some of that kind of tectonic knowledge across the site. Um, these terraces that sit on the water's front, the kind of use of material. We actually, between us, we got sacked from this job towards the end. <laughs> um, Australand and we, I, probably at that point, had a difference opinion. We had um, over documented the facades to have more zinc than probably we needed, kind of knowing that some of it would get pulled out. Anyway, we got sacked and they didn't pull any of it out, they just kept it all in. So we ended up getting the buildings we wanted, which was quite nice. <laughs> um, but you can see this kind of rhythm that we were trying to pick up from the, from the um, heritage neighbourhood. Um, the old, some of the old, in the end, the only things remaining of the original sorting sheds were three columns and one wall. So we created these um, pergolas. We originally wanted to make them as um, kayak sheds so people could put their kayak in and out. Um, we couldn't convince the developer at that point to do that, but they've become these um, almost picnic um, pergolas in the, in the land. And I think one of the nicest things is seeing people always down in the park. So we call it, even though it's the Glebe Har um, Foreshore Park, we call it, our, we think it's our park. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of activity and it's become a really important place for this, the people in Glebe in this area and it's helped um, form part of the Foreshore Walk. Um, the, uh, people should know that uh, at the beginning, the residents were so against the change that there was a save the container resident group. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is actually, I think this one, I think it was this community, there was 157 people came to the community consultation, well, it was more a, a community anger action group, and I think this was the one that someone spat on me. It was like a really aggressive, aggressive meeting. It was really not much fun at that point. Um, I was questioning into my desire to live in Sydney and be an architect. <laughs> but, um, but now they love it, so that's good, you know, in the end. <laughs> Actually, in St Margaret's we had similar action groups and one of the ladies who was most aggressive about St Margaret's, um, I caught coming out of the, one of the buildings the other day, she bought an apartment in the building. I'm like, <laughs> my God! <laughs> um, one of my more recent projects, uh, this was a collaboration we did with Billard Lease with a client, have a very fantastic client, Michael Grant, who has three or four architects that he always works with and I met him by accident through another client and he said, well, maybe you should do this, but you can't do it by yourself. You need to do it with Billard Lease because I don't know who you are yet. So David Lease and I worked on this project, which was really fantastic. Um, so the office, our office is here. So again, we're kind of keeping a thing about being close to the office, but it's in the kind of threshold between um, Redfern and kind of small scale terrace houses and this kind of old South Sydney industrial, excuse me, light industrial sites. Um, the original subdivision patterns. So you can see these big subdivision patterns. This was the old ICI site sitting through here. Um, you can see over time how it kind of grew into this very industrial hub and the small scale development. You can see in through here the start of social housing going on, 
um, through here. Um, this is the site. Winnings Appliances have been um, continuously operating on this site for, at the point where we took the project, 98 years. Um, and they, they needed to retain that continuous trading, which was a very large challenge for us. So we essentially kept them in this bit of the building, demolished all of this, built all of this, and then demolished that and built that again. So it was a very challenging project. But in the end, um, this is North Phillips Street and South is um, Dank Street. Dank Street has a really lovely uh, kind of F and B um, foodies kind of destination. Uh, but the idea was to locate the buildings around a courtyard or a cloister. We had some existing buildings that were quite close to us. And that, that through site link would become part of the public domain um, through the centre of the site. And you could come through the site without getting wet. So there was a kind of ability, if you were cutting from this part of the city where the bus drops you, you didn't have to go around the block. You could just come through the centre of the site. Um, Phillip Street has a 1.8 metre flood limit. So we have to be able to pond 1.8 metres in Phillip Street, which is interesting if you live here in this terrace house, but um, we had to bring that street level up. And so that's very challenging to get a through site link happening when you've got, when people can't actually see through it. How do you make that appropriate? Um, so the intent was to keep the street frontages very strong, hold the street edges so that they did become, the streets remain, retained their idea of, um, of streets and very strong edge streets. We'd push one edge in and open one edge up. Um, we'd create these kind of pockets of um, courtyards through the site and then these three buildings that wrapped around it. Um, on the north side, this kind of dint in the front of the building points to the way in which you move through the building. Um, so this kind of very simple idea of painted white brickwork and everything below that is a recycled brick. Um, so there's this kind of very strong texture to the base, this kind of public texture, and at the upper level it's very quiet. A kind of north-facing veranda um, through site link running through, you start to see the light. And when you come into the main space, you get this cloistered space that wraps around. Uh, and really trying to deal with some of the adjoining um, residential apartment buildings around by putting planters on top of them and creating this very strong internal space. A bit of water, it's, um, this is on the south side of the building, so to get a bit of light reflection through that space, create a bit of noise so that residents living above had a bit of white noise. Um, the client installed fully grown trees, which was um, sensational in terms of the product. Um, but then this activity that happens at the ground level, so there's about 5,000 square metres of retail uh, and the cloister really does a good job at um, separating the retail from the residential above and that noise, that acoustic issue that always happens. Um, it's been really well received. People in Sydney completely love this space and uh, there's, it's always popping up on Instagram so we kind of know we've done okay when they pop it, taking photos of themselves in the space. But all of these trees are just um, large bonsai trees really. They're on top of car parks so they're in a big pot. Uh, and figs in Sydney will grow anywhere. So that idea of creating these um, beautiful moments through the space. Um, this idea, this is a kind of two metre deep um, planter before you hit the building next door, but this idea of framing that and kind of talking, uh, talking architecturally about the idea there's space beyond that immediate space, so trying to make the spaces feel bigger than they actually are. Um, you know, some play, you know, it's always important to be playful, but being playful with door handles. Um, originally this was designed for a house and the height of these were the heights of the kids when they moved in. Um, um, so we, we, we took that idea across onto this project and traced some of the people in the office's kids. Um, roof gardens to try and help with um, both outlook but also to deal with um, stormwater issues. Um, and then just you know some, some screens which help start to break down the southern edge of the facade and winnings. Um, the only complaint I get about this building is from winnings because we made a really deep reveal here with the intent that people would sit there and have a coffee in the street and sit in the window. Um, winnings hate that. <laughs> so we're trying to work out what to do to make them love that, but anyway. Um, um, this little project was really a collaboration with uh, the client, Greg, who bought this piece of land literally on his credit card. Um, and he bought it at exactly the right time when it went from a two-storey height limit to a six-storey height limit. Pretty much overnight, he was absolutely in the right place at the right time. Um, and we really wanted to investigate, he and, he's got an incredible level of eye of detail, but we wanted to investigate using concrete throughout and could we make this a really um, materially uh, honest building. Um, in section, it's about getting cars up above ground and keeping retail at the bottom and these residential apartments which run through above. We have very strict res apartment requirements in Sydney where you must have north light and you must have cross ventilation. So um, it's super, super um, difficult. Um, I won't go through the plans, but the idea was to create these very uh, 
incredibly livable but ex very small. So this is 75 square metre two bedroom apartment which is the minimum size we can do for a two bedroom apartment in Sydney. But try to make them incredibly well planned. Um, have a bit of fun at the top, have a very strong robust concrete um, base to the building. Um, and then play in the kind of points where people touch. So when you came into the lobby, there'd be this beautiful, um, very lustrous um, um, tiled base. Um, and then this little moment where my sister-in-law is a poet. So there's not much work for poets. <laughs> so I was like, why don't you do a poem for the building and I'll somehow get the developer to pay to do the poem and this will be a bit of public art. Um, so Emily wrote this poem um, which I think is really incredibly beautiful uh, to kind of do something very simple like have somebody write a piece of writing specifically for a building. Um, she charged $200 and sent the invoice through to me to send on to the client. I just photoshopped an extra zero on the end because I thought that he was getting way more value than $200. Um, he paid and that was all good. So, um, um, so they, uh, it's important to do little, little things like this where we can start to kind of imbue the building with a little bit more than just being an architect, I think, because sometimes, you know, sometimes we want, we want to leave a mark which is more than the concrete mark on the building. But, you know, little things like making the apartments, make, sitting the fridge in this box up off the ground so that it felt like a piece of furniture rather than a piece of, piece of um, you know, uh, rather than a fridge. Massive balconies, you know, it's all pretty standard. Um, this was a project which does anyone know Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, the movie? So the lady who I did this for was the producer of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, Rebel, Penfold Russell. Um, she is fantastic. She is completely and utterly crazy in a good way. But I got almost sacked eight times on this project. Um, but the site is, sits in Ben Buckler and she had bought two buildings here and we demolished two buildings to produce one. And her idea is that there was nowhere for people with kids to live in Bondi because pretty much everything in Bondi is one bedroom apartments or houses. So her intent was to build um, three bedroom apartments. Um, so this is the site, it has amazing views. It's not the best because it's not right on the front but it has amazing views out across this park. Um, the building next door to it is a social housing building. So there's kind of challenges but good challenges I suppose. Um, we did a whole lot of drawings, about um, sketches about the types of spaces we wanted to create, what would happen when you came in, what the front doors would be like, these kind of gardens and waters, spaces that would exist, how we would do two-storey apartments. These were literally the first sketches we did for the project. Um, how to deal with the fact the neighbour was literally two metres away from us. So how do you deal with the fact that you want to look out but you don't want to look out into someone else's bathroom or laundry or anything. Um, so the intent was to create this very thick outside facade which gave us um, sh um, essentially cover. So if you looked out, you, you, you never looked directly out, you always looked out on an angle and you would see a view. So this, from the outside you then got these reveals and we wanted to make um, this idea that the, the, the outside skin of the building, the white bit was really robust and really mundane and then when we cut the skin on the angle it became really um, luscious and beautiful and that was a marble um, piece. Um, so you can see here these cuts, so the, the kind of robust rendered painted white piece and then the marble reveals um, and the way in which you can't see into these, the main entry um, coming into the site. Um, this was another chance where we got to commission an artist, so this is uh, Mika Popovitsen who's become a very good friend of mine. He, um, and Rebel introduced me to him actually and he's a, an artist who deals a lot in sculpture so he made this beautiful piece of eight tonnes of concrete sculpted into the headland which exists across the other side of the road, uh, which was really amazing for us to be involved in that commission process and briefing and installation um, of this art piece. It's really beautiful. Um, making the staircases in this building part of the experience so it wasn't locked behind a door and you actually used the stairs rather than getting the lift all the time. Um, just little details about how to sign, sign apartments. And then these moments where you got the slit that gave you the view um, but at the same time, that's that slit. So you're not seeing into somebody's bedroom or bathroom directly opposite. Um, it's an amazing view, you know. Um, it's pretty spectacular. Um, and we've taken that idea onto other projects. I mean, often you start doing these kind of ideas in these top end projects and they start to filter down into the more um, price sensitive projects, which we're doing, we're doing one of those. So one of those unfortunately not, <laughs> no, unfortunately not. <laughs> 
Um, for both streets, uh, the client bought this site without, uh, and then asked us to do it. It's, it used to be the old taxi combined site in Surrey Hills. Um, again, I won't talk the plans about a lot, but in essence, it's a courtyard in the centre and two buildings split down the middle, kind of through this line. Um, and you can see this courtyard or uh, light void, which runs through the centre, and you've got a lane at the back and for Vaux Street at the front. There's a massive fall across this site um, from about, that's street level here, and then street level is down about here. So there's like about a six metre fall across the length of the site, so it's very challenging. Um, this is the project sitting in the middle. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was start to play, you always approach this building on the diagonal. So you, we wanted these um, blades to do a couple of things. One, to present the building as a more solid object because all of the heritage buildings beside were solid buildings, solid facades with punched openings um, like these. Um, and most residential apartment buildings are completely glazed and kind of rob the street of that solidity. Um, so kind of starting to reference this through the use of these blades, but also use the blades to reflect light and help deflect some sound because for Vaux Street it's incredibly um, noisy. Um, and then when you come around they start to open up. Um, there's a bit of playfulness at the top. We do believe there should be some joy in buildings and it kind of tends to happen at the top and the bottom. Um, uh, and also the awning. So the awning was an opportunity to help mediate this incredibly steep fall um, to, down the street. Um, this was another point where we were able to commission Mika to do an art piece. So the art piece became the lighting underneath the awning, which just kind of has a very slight twinkling going on um, and provides the public domain lighting. So it kind of does two aspects of the project. Um, it's a really, you know, you can see front on, it opens up, these balconies cut back and there's gardens that now are in each of those cascading down the front edge. You can just see a bit of it there. Um, this kind of separation of the, re the residential to the retail below. The internal courtyard. Um, we do believe that you should always be able to be outside. Um, that you should, that we hate the idea that you open an apartment door and you enter into an enclosed corridor, which is kind of tends to be not well lit and a bit kind of nasty. Um, we like to open them up, particularly in Sydney, the weather's really, really good, so why not actually just know what the day is like when you open the door? Um, but also having secondary windows into bedroom, into um, kitchens um, off this edge where you can open a window in a kitchen so you don't, you know, you're not stuck in the deep depths of an apartment um, through that and just some of the typical parts. We didn't do the interiors on this project, it was done by another architectural firm. Uh, and the rooftop garden sitting on top. Um, there's just two more projects and then one Leah told me she had to tell you, how's my time? Are we bought, is everyone bored yet or is it all right? All right. Um, so these, this is what, these are the projects that I'm probably becoming most excited about. So we kind of have, uh, we now understand in Sydney what apartments we have to do and what we have to do to make them good, in inverted commas. Um, but Newcastle, I've been working on this for about eight years and a client bought a piece of land. Newcastle, if you've never been there, is one of the most beautiful cities in this country. Um, it, this is the centre of town, um, the historical centre of town, the East End, and this is the, these are the beaches, here's the harbour. And there used to be a train line that went all the way around this edge through here, which cut the entire city off from the harbour. And about six years ago, the government decided to remove the heavy rail, stop the heavy rail back here, and put in light rail, which is being built at the moment, which is the best thing they could have ever done. Um, so this is the West End, where the, light, the heavy rail will stop and the light rail will start. The Civic Centre, which is where Town Hall is, and then the East End, which is the old historic part of the city. Um, and so our client owned all of this, uh, pretty much. They owned all of these sites in red. Um, they bought it just before the GFC, and they had a scheme by an architect, which was an approved, to demolish everything and build a shopping centre like a Chadston here. Chadston, 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 um, through here. So massive kind of footprint. Um, across the site. Uh, kind of luckily for Newcastle, the GFC hit and retail dived and they couldn't afford to do it. So they went back into a process, they appointed us to look at a process of how to make residential work in this part of the city. Um, the first thing we did was find old photographs. This used to be the bustling part of Newcastle. It was the place everyone used to come to. So these are the old photographs of what Newcastle used to be and this is what it was like now. So the David Jones building on the right used to be amazing. It's completely closed down, boarded up. Um, there used to be kind of a nice wide street and there's now detritus all through that street of bollards and chairs and nasty bloody trees that are kind of falling over. Um, you can see there used to be an amazing connection from the harbour from the harbour and the kind of fishing experience into the, into the city and this kind of heavy rail had cut that off. Originally the rail was kind of lighter so you could kind of cross it. Um, and the buildings, although there, lots of them were still there, they'd taken off a lot of their 
kind of jewelry. Um, you know, the trees kind of robbed you of a lot of experience of the top. There's these beautiful little buildings that were still sitting in behind, but were never been identified by councils being of any heritage value. So they were able to be demolished. Um, so we fought quite hard to try and keep these buildings. Um, and you can see this is a beautiful building. It was, had this lovely thing on it. And then in the 80s, somebody put this horrendous thing on it. Um, but you can see it's still there um, in behind. And then this used to be Market Street, which was called Market Street because you used to be able to bring the fish from the harbour up the Market Street and into the market, which is behind me here. And then they built this. <laughs> uh, they took all of the verandas off this building. But you can see it's still kind of there. This used to be the market. You used to be able to see through there. That's what they replaced it with which is pretty horrendous. Um, so, you know, part of the process for us is how do we undo some of the, uh, the negative kind of changes that happened to the city in the past and how do we give them back some, some buildings? So these are the heritage items. Um, we went through a kind of grain uh, discussion. This was 1850s, 1870s, 1890s, 1910s. You can see 1960, all of the grain got lost. They kind of built to everything and there was no way to kind of, there was no permeable ground plane. So it felt just very um, repressive actually. Um, so our intent was to create a loop and put a new lane back in. So there could be, one of the big things in retail, um, high streets at least, is you, you can't just walk up and down. You kind of need to walk around. If you can walk around, people will kind of wander and investigate and they'll kind of enjoy the space and they'll stay longer and they'll spend more and all those kind of things, which is what happens in shopping centres because they create loops for you and things like that. But in this case, because we had this, we were able to create like a shopping centre loop but without it being a shopping centre. Um, so we did all this work, we got all this approved, we looked at laneways, we looked at Melbourne ones and Sydney ones to see which, what were the dimensions were. We kind of wanted to think about things that people could do in the city without having to pay because often it's always about putting a coffee shop, but actually we've got too many coffee shops. We need to put things in which are about just watching people and enjoying life. Markets, um, how, did the, how does the city change for festivals? What are the kind of major attractors that are going to be in the centre? Like how do you give back um, places? You know, everyone, when I lived in Melbourne, everyone said, I'll meet you underneath the, the clocks at Flinders Street. So it was kind of one of those things that you knew. What are those anchors in um, Newcastle? Um, what are the kind of light, what are the um, uses going to be? Where, how do you put, how do you start to curate a kind of retail experience? Um, and how, where do you put commercial and residential? Because you do need a diversity of residential and commercial. If you put all residential, it just becomes dead. So we've got to put some commercial into that space. Um, this was a very, very, very challenging um, project. Um, the original height limit on the site was here. Um, this is the cathedral sitting in the background. Um, one of the challenges with residential in New South Wales is because you are required to have natural light, which is kind of nice, and ventilation, um, you can't just jam things down in a pancake style. You need to kind of pull things up into more tower typologies. Um, and at the same time, if people are going to live above retail, they don't want to live above a chicken shop. So how do you give them that, that kind of um, separation away from some of those probably very essential chicken shops, but you need to give them that space emotionally? Um, so we looked at this, we got this approved, um, we looked at, there's a seven storey drop from one street to the next drop, so how do you negotiate that piece of terrain? Um, we, came, we kind of developed a master plan which became this as a massing structure, you can see the buildings we retained in terms of facades and, and structure and in some cases entire buildings. Um, we then tested that, so we had ourselves and three other architects do some schemes, so this was an SJB component, but creating this new um, public lane with a lane on top of it because of the change in, if I go back here, so this is in this space, the new lane that sits up here uh, and another lane that sits underneath. So the idea of this kind of retail shopping environment um, coming from Morgan Street, there's the uh, Hunter Street, here's the cathedral sitting in the background, um, the old David Jones to be renewed, a tower that would sit on the corner, we got um, uh, Bennett and Trimble to look at a new cinema and the use for the old bank to become a pub and a kind of beer garden, um, kind of activity environment. Um, we looked at uh, another small architectural firm, Stuart Holstein, to look at a residential apartment building. So kind of trying to test them because we were never going to, we were never going to be the architects on the site. We just wanted to create the kind of framework to enable the, the architects, whoever ended up doing it, to do it because we wanted that diversity. Um, luckily, so our client was, a, was GPT and the state government in New South Wales. They then sold the site, and one of our other clients bought the site, which was excellent for us. 
Um, so this is where it is at the moment. There is the first site is stage one. It's under construction, uh, and we we stayed true to our word and we invited two other architects to be involved. So there's ourselves. Um, there is Tonkins Like Greer Architects and Durback Block Jagers Architects, who we are two architects who we think are sensational at what they do. Um, the David Jones building here is to be adaptively used to into a boutique hotel. So we're currently under we're doing we're going through that process. Um, this is the SJB building, which is a kind of the largest residential component on stage one. Um, at the rear of the site, so this idea of a kind of solid bottom and then the kind of tower sitting above that to kind of create that gap between the two. It's got a supermarket sitting at the bottom. One of the big things in this end of the city is you've, if you're going to get people to live here, you need the amenities. So you've got to get a supermarket in or else they'll just get in their car and drive to Charleston, we, Charlestown. We want to keep them um, here. Um, this is the Tonkins Alika Greer. So David Jones 1, David Jones 2, David Jones 3. Um, David Jones 2 and 3 had been badly damaged during the earthquake in Newcastle and there was not much left of them except for parts of the facade. David Jones 1 was pretty intact, so that's the hotel. These two were keeping the facades and building a residential building behind. And the Durback, jo Durback Block Jagers building, which sits on top of the David Jones Food Hall, which was um, obviously a deco building. Um, so we really love this kind of diversity of architecture and this kind of collaborative environment, which we think gets a better outcome. The new laneway that runs through, SJB on the right, um, TZG and DBJ sitting at the back. A new courtyard that sits in the centre, rooftop gardens, you know, um, pretty... I mean, in the end, it's kind of pretty standard. It's kind of what you expect to see, but um, we're excited that we're able to get a variety of architects. This is the site two weeks ago, so it's actually happening, which is... Uh, it's huge. This is, this is the back of David Jones once. That will become the boutique hotel. Uh, and the uh, TZG building goes in here and the SJB one here. The other one in this vein is a project which we won in Circular Quay, um, which is part of an AMP project. So they own 50 Bridge Street, which is here, um, and they own a little building here, a little part of a block here. And part of the, the ability to redevelop this site is they had to harness some floor space off this part of the site and deliver it over here. They had an international competition for the tower, which was awarded to uh, 3XN Architects, which is currently under construction, this bit of the tower. And our part of the site was divided into, so here's the site, um, here's the site here. This is Customs House, Circular Quay, um, 50 Bridge Street. Um, so Customs House and existing buildings, 50 Bridge. There's on our part of the site, so we were the, we're the executives for the project across the entire site. We're building one of the buildings. Sylvester Fuller, architects from Sydney, are doing one. Ed Lipman is doing the adaptive reuse of this building. Make Ar Mel Bright from Make Architecture is doing this building. And Carter Williamson is doing the adaptive reuse of that building. And Aspect Studios are doing the landscape. So my role specifically on this was to make sure that everyone played well in the sandpit and that they didn't kind of get at each other. Um, and architects are fantastic because we've all got egos, which helps in the sense that it became a really competitive environment. So everyone was trying to do something better than everyone else, which is actually in the end really great for the project. Um, there's a whole lot of heritage considerations like a historical drain that was six metres below the ground that we couldn't build over or under, which kind of caused some challenges. The original point at which the, the surveying point for the entire New South Wales or Australian colony, the New South Wales colony at that point, was sitting here, so that's the point at which all surveying points were taken from in the colony early on, um, could be seen from an entry at 50 Bridge, so what we were doing with that. Um, and the other thing on the site was that it was incredibly steep, so we wanted to get um, disabled or um, able access across the site without having to go upstairs and lifts. So we carved some new laneways through the site which were at um, DDA compliant um, grades. Um, and we revealed two um, external walls of heritage buildings which weren't going to be revealed so we tried to kind of celebrate the heritage buildings in a kind of more direct way. Um, one of the things we wanted to do across the architects was not be not do the same type of architecture but use some similar ideas so that our so that the buildings started to talk to each other so it was understanding that the rooftops had to be something because you were going to look down on a lot of the rooftops we wanted to have really uh, habitable edges so that the buildings had a thickness to them um, which was both from a heritage and kind of streetscape point of view but also from an amenity of living point of view. We didn't want to create objects, we wanted to create space, so this is the Nolly diagram of Rome and this idea of creating space rather than buildings uh, and we wanted to use brick so how, do, how could we all use brick in a way that would start to kind of bring in that grain and texture. Um, our building um, it was a proper mixed use or is a proper mixed use, two levels of retail, three levels of commercial and seven or eight levels of residential. Um, 
how do we start to play with some of the verticality and break up in the building? How do we start to kind of play with the rooftop so that there is a kind of, it doesn't end up being a pancake. Um, we want kind of a skyline um, going on. Um, and then how do we start to deal with the awnings again, which start to touch the street? I mean, Sydney is horrendous for rain at certain times of the year. And if you just, you just have to have an awning or else it's kind of awful. Um, and rooftop gardens, how do we start to permeate the rooftop to have gardens across it? Um, this is currently under construction. This is the heritage building, which Carter Williamson are doing. It's a little lane that we inserted just between those two buildings, which everyone thought we were crazy at doing. It's only 1.2 metres wide, so it's just enough for one person to walk through. But actually, when they demolished the building that sat there, there's heritage signs on the edge of that building. So it used to be way, which is quite lovely to see. Uh, and then our building, which steps up. So commercial sitting through here and residential above. They actually sold this apartment building completely before there was any display suite. Um, we ended up building the display suite six months after they were all sold just to show everybody what they had bought because the client was a bit worried that people didn't know what they'd bought. Um, the new laneway, Sylvester Fuller on the left and Make Architecture on the left as well and us on the right. And then this is Mel Bright's building from Make. This is Sylvester Villa's, Fuller's building and that's the bit of our building in the back and 3XN sitting in the background with the um, massive office tower. Leah told me I had to, this is the last project. Um, Leah told me I, had, I wasn't going to show this project, but Leah said I had to. Um, this is my house, so my husband didn't buy this one, I bought this one. Um, <laughs> we were doing the adaptive reuse of these buildings, and uh, this is with uh, Michael Grant from Cornerstone, but this was a tobacco warehouse, and this was a machinery warehouse. And it wasn't a tobacco warehouse for long. The um, Demco Machinery Company bought it and turned it into their warehousing for machinery uh, just prior to the World War II. Uh, they then built this building, um, and this was the showroom for machinery. So you used to be able to take a tractor, look at a tractor and take it up onto the roof and drive it around, because there was a goods lift to take you up there. Um, anyway, we, bought, we were doing this project, and um, the idea was to cut a hole in the middle. Uh, because it was a heritage facade, we couldn't put balconies on it, which is a requirement in New South Wales to have balconies. So we had to kind of um, do something, you know, we had to kind of give people balconies without giving them balconies. So we created a roof garden and we were creating a, an apartment on the roof and cutting this hole through the centre. Um, this was another one of those moments where I was we were going to buy a one bedroom investment apartment and then my business partner in Sydney said, no, don't, don't buy that apartment, buy this apartment, um, which wasn't an apartment at the time, it was just a kind of an idea. We didn't think it would get approved. Anyway, um, it sits in the back of Sydney. This is Central Station and this is... Uh, Prince Alfred Park, that's where the project is. That's Cleveland Street. The office, our office is here. So this is Surrey Hills and this is Redfern. More park. Um, and Great Buckingham Street. So Great Buckingham Street was, uh, all the buildings are, were, were demolished in there at the turn of the century by the city. And they built Great Buckingham Street as the perfect street. And it's probably one of the most beautiful streets to walk down in Sydney now. Uh, and it sits right on the axis with um, Redfern Oval and Redfern Park. And it was kind of the part, one of the city's ways of starting to regenerate this area um, at the turn of the century. Um, this was the building as we got it. Um, it had been lots of things over the years. You can see some of the, the kind of rooftop poking out. Um, it was really beautiful uh, as kind of the bones were really beautiful. Um, and this was in the 1940s building and then in the 1910 building you can see these kind of um, precast columns. This was the original Lift used to take the tractor up and used to drive the tractor around on the roof. I think they only did it four times, but it was kind of urban myth. Uh, and there was a staircase that came up to the top. So the project for my house was to... Um, we were taking a lift core up to get access onto a communal roof garden, which was sitting here. Um, and then it was to adjoin this stair overrun and this lift overrun with an apartment. Um, the thing we wanted to do with this was, was essentially create a garden with a house that you happen to live in in the garden. So instead of creating an apartment which had a garden, let's create a garden and put an apartment around it. Um, and so the apartment has 350 square metres of garden. It's only 180 square metres internally, but it's a massive garden attached to it. Um, and the other thing we wanted to do is play, I mean lots of these, when you do your own place you kind of get the opportunity to try things that lots of people tell you you can't do. Um, so it was the rooftop garden and creating voids and skylights down into the apartment below so you could see the sky and use the sky as a kind of another view. Um, um, I won't go through all of this, but <clears throat> it's just for... It's also off 95% off-grid, so we generate all, most of our own power. Um, the, we have an electric car in the basement, so it was kind of trying to see whether how far we could push a pretty standard apartment in a way. Um, 
So the floor plan is you come up in this lift into the main apartment and then these gardens kind of cut around and into the house uh, and there's a kind of fireplace which helps separate the communal garden to the private garden. Um, so you're coming in here, bedroom sits in the old lift over run and ensuite, um, kitchen, bedroom, bedroom, bathroom, bathroom. Uh, and then the roof garden which sits above that and the study which sits in the old lift over run um, sits right at the top. Um, so the main entry, um, we commissioned Anna Willey, who's a really amazing Australian artist, sculptor, to make these birds. In Indigenous um, culture, if a red-tailed black cockatoo flies overhead, it's a good luck. And my husband works in, in, with Indigenous um, communities. Um, so this idea of commissioning her to make these um, birds. Um, the main living space, um, and just this idea of gardens coming into the, putting a fireplace in, you know, like, I suppose just trying to play with ideas, framing gardens in the space so that it did become like you were living outside rather than um, living inside the pond overlooking towards Parramatta. Um, you know, outdoor fireplace, this big tree that we craned in to get up onto the roof. There's, a, there's about eight, about 600 to 800 mils of soil in certain places. So we are able, because it was originally designed to have tractors driving around the roof, we could, put, we could load the building up with extra structure that we would normally not be able to do an apartment building. And every developer tells me you can't do a roof garden because it leaks. So I was like, okay, well, let's try it. Let's do a roof garden. Um, let's see if it leaks, because if it leaks, it's going to leak on me. <laughs> um, the main view out, and this kind of idea of this screen, which folds back and forwards to kind of mediate between the communal garden, which just is on the other side of that, and the private garden, um, the kitchen, Everyone was like, you're really going to do a green kitchen? <laughs> um, uh, outdoor bathtub. Um, and then um, the main roof itself. Oh, that's Eric's house. Um, I won't talk about this. Uh, this is a sh the main shower, which has a two-story void up to the roof. So you can kind of see when you're in the shower, you see the sky. Um, to get out to the, sh to the bath, you didn't want to get the carpet wet. So coming into the shower from the bath, um, back into the main bedroom. Um, the study up on the top floor, and then the main roof garden, which really honestly, when you're out on the main roof garden, you pretty much don't know that you're on a building. You think you're at ground level. These trees have doubled in size. They're up about here now. Like, we were a bit worried for a while they might blow off the roof. Um, they're, they're about four and a half metres tall now. They're just a, a native um, banksia. Um, and a piece of art we bought for, specifically for it, but yeah. That's it. Yeah.